curiously, we have not one, but two throwbacks to earlier Game Boy titles with Ninja Taro. If you remember Maru's mission from a little while ago, you may recall that I said that it was the only Ninja Jajamarakun game released in the West. And it is, but Ninja Taro is related, if only loosely. The more intriguing link is a more historical one. The game is set in feudal Japan, at the time when Lord Takeda Shingen was pronounced dead. The country's biggest enemy, one Oda Nobunaga, started to become ambitious, and started talking about unifying all of Japan under his leadership. As the most valiant ninja, help Lord Nobu in his quest to rid the last vestiges of evil and unite the entire country. Unlike Nobunaga's ambition, this is not a strategy game, but actually an action RPG. It's quite a simplistic one, as there's no real levelling up system, nor is there much puzzle solving or currency in the game. Character improvements are made by finding things like sword, shuriken, and health upgrades in the overworld. A lot of the action takes place in the overworld, with very little story progression taking place in towns or villages. Most NPCs are not so helpful, conversation is not their strong point, but you do need to speak to them as there's usually one in any new place that acts as a trigger point, giving you some quest or pointer where to go next. There are a couple when you get to the main hub where the king lives that'll give you certain consumables to progress. These are few but necessary, and act as the directors of the game in that some aren't immediately available but need to be unlocked, so to speak. This is something that Zelda games do with great aplomb, of course. For instance, you need the hookshot or flippers or whatever to be able to do X and Y. In Ninja Taro, there aren't nearly as many, nor are their applications as wide-ranging, but they're there nonetheless. Something called water spiders allow you to cross narrow sections of river, and ladders help you scale and descend cliff faces. You can hold up to 15 of these at any time, and it's good to learn which enemies allow you to farm them, and stock up before embarking on any large quests. It really sucks to get 90% of the way into a dungeon, only to run out of water spiders and not be able to reach the final boss. Other collectibles are found in chests all over the place. Some raise the power of your end sword, some your Murasame, a slightly different sword, some improve your throwing stars, that sort of thing. Other pickups include herbs and potions that heal you, bombs that can be used offensively, and spells that cloak you in fire or make you blend into the scenery. There are also key items that you need to find. Often these are held by a boss and include things like scrolls, important plot points, keys, and a sorrow crystal that is used to destroy an ogre later on. Your soundtrack is very good, musically at least. There aren't too many sound effects, but the songs are well composed with a nice variety. The graphics err on the side of utility a lot of the time. They're decent enough, although your character looks like a chubby monk, even though he's supposed to be a ninja. The enemy variation is pretty good, and they all have their own movement patterns and strengths. There are some great cutscenes though, which provide a delightful respite from both the unrelenting action and the monotonous overworlds. Expect to see quite a bit of tile repetition. That's not such a big deal on an 8-bit system, of course, and the game is pretty huge. It's a long slog, actually, one that I'm yet to finish off. It's easy to forget that this game was at least loosely based in actual human history. The story is great, though, and the telling of it captivating. That's as important as anything in a grand adventure.
thanks so much for watching this video. Let me know your thoughts on the game down below, and if you can spare a second, give the review a quick thumbs up, it really helps out. Subscribe to the Portable Power Podcast for a new Game Boy review every day from Monday to Friday. Or, alternately, new episodes of the podcast drop every Saturday and Sunday on whichever platform you get your pods. See you later on.